And we are live. JT Marital Arts Podcast number 38. I was already taking a sip of my coffee. Oh. We can pretend that. Uh, oh, let's, okay. just, let's, let's, oh, look, your sippy cup is almost empty. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thank you. JT. Ah, delicious coffee on a. Is it Saturday? Is it Sunday? It's Sunday. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to go riding soon here. It's yeah. awesome out. It is uh, probably sixty-five degrees right now. Going to get up to eighty-two. I think it's a little bit warmer already, but yeah, it's going to get up to ninety, and it's been very humid. Yeah. Excellent riding weather. Well. People think we're crazy, but it we do ride mostly in the woods, and that's a lot cooler. It's a lot cooler. The humidity isn't any different, but but you're it's moving. Cooler, you're moving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes over 20 miles an hour. Yeah. Holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Cranking. So, what is our topic this morning? Uh, I was going to talk food. Because uh, I need to put together a menu, which really has just been, a, we've been doing a lot of our repeat stuff, which we seem to don't, not mind. Yeah, we seem to don't mind it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> but we need to pick up a few things at the grocery store, and um, hopefully, I'm sure this won't be too mundane. We'll find something to... Tell me some of your story yesterday about you were talking to a friend that was, Starry's here, you are talking to a friend that was interested in uh, cataclysms. Oh, gosh. Uh, What would happen if, how would you do this? Is this relating back to food? What do you think about that? Well, yeah, you need stores of food, right? Definitely. We Um, buy case quantities. We have multiple freezers. Should I answer that in the way that I actually want to address it? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Like, I really hate talking about this subject. Yeah. And so I like to just get through it. It's like a Band-Aid, you know, a big <laughs> Band-Aid that you, it only happens, hopefully, a few times in your life that you need a big Band-Aid. And you're like, it's just rip this thing off. And uh, so, yeah, we... I think for a while early in our marriage, it it probably took you a while to convince me that something like that, some cataclysmic event could happen. Well, actually, first, a year after we were married or into our first year, uh, 9-11 happened. I didn't have to convince you of anything. (laughs) No, you were presenting information that I didn't know. I already had generators. I already had... Well, it was convenient. You were a racer, too, so you happened to have a lot of that kind of... That kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I've been a prepper. I'm a race of prepper. Yeah. <laughs> so 9-11 happened soon after we were married, and yeah. so that that will open your eyes. And, you know, for, I'd say, my generation and your generation, too, you know, there was relatively little catastrophe, you know? Yeah. No, I remember the, gas lines when I was a kid, about eight, nine years old. There was cars lined up for miles trying to get to to the gas station to get gasoline there was a gas there was an OPEC like some sort of a embargo and the United States didn't have gasoline then they limited how much you could get but also being kids you know during that time it it is doesn't seem to affect you as I was very aware of it Okay. Speak for yourself. Too. I'll speak for myself. First of all, I wasn't alive during that time, but and so you? there has been, there was to that point, very little personal effect. Now, nine eleven, I think, it emotionally affected everybody um, in, I would say, in the U.S. Uh, what happened after that? Then what we experienced personally, more around the 2005 era, the housing crash that affected five, six, six, seven, seven, 
Okay. Well, we saw stuff coming earlier because yeah. like you said late 2006. Your yeah. business um, sees the effects of the economy or what's coming along sooner, yeah. and so that started affecting us sooner and lasted longer just because there was more of an overall kind of fallout. So I think with those occurrences, you know, fairly early in our marriage, as I was learning about prepper kind of stuff, you know, what if a solar flare, what is a solar flare, how would it affect, you know, if it was so big, how would it affect a certain region, you know, can it be used as a weapon, all sorts of things, you know, it was starting to kind of come together. Can a solar flare be used as a weapon? Can it? Is that what you said? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Is the sun our enemy? John, I have seen Marvel comic <laughs> movies and so forth, and there's probably some evil doer that has it's throwing t- solar flares. Yeah, they us. can throw solar flares. Okay. So uh, I'll buy into that a bit. Yeah. How do you know what is not real? I didn't say. I, mean, I didn't say it wasn't real. I said I'll buy into it. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, I'm. You know, like you've said a long time ago, Could when be. like when the Transformer movie, movies came out, like how do you know? That Corvette is not, or Camaro is not just going to <laughs> transform. <laughs> yeah. So, <coughs> over time, I believe the information that I was learning from you and what was happening in the world made it seem more of a potential. Mm-hmm. And and so, as we've been able to, we've you know, made sure we have certain things in place. And it it has, it does and it does not, it, it factors into our life to a certain degree, but it is not like the A number one topic. So, yes, my friend brought it up the other day. We were out to lunch, and uh, somehow she had gotten into the topic, and um, but probably was surprised how much I knew about the topic. And... <laughs> Uh, but it, like I said, it's not something I like to talk about. Actually, once we went down that path, I'm like, we need to change the subject. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, it was her birthday, and I brought cupcakes. So I said, let's have a cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> and I honestly hope that if there's anything catastrophic like th- that, you know, that it, like you had said, if it if if it has a big enough effect to interrupt technology delivery services manufacturing for what a couple weeks you said that we will basically go back a hundred years in technology yeah the the statement is if we lose electricity for for two to four weeks um the estimates are that we won't have electricity in our lifetime again which is astounding because hardly anyone, you know, it would just be the Amish and the Hutterites and yep. so forth that would be able the, to... The Hutterites are, are actually technological. Okay. Yeah. The, the Amish, Mennonites? The Amish. For uh, sure the Amish. Anybody that's already living off-grid, I mean, none of their electronics would work. Mm-hmm. Um, depends on how much, if the solar flare is big enough, would it go, would it affect the entire Earth? Would it affect yeah. just the side that it hits? Um, yeah. So, so basically my your bicycle, yeah. if you ha- we have e-bikes, so our pedal part of our bikes would work. Oh, thank goodness we upgraded and got the lighter ones. They're a little bit heavy. You have heavier. the carbon fiber, so you're better off. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't leave you behind. Okay, good. <laughs> your guns would work. We need to get a horse. Your rake would work. Your hoe would work. Your, your, no, I mean your... Your hoe for hoeing weeds in the garden. Oh, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, yeah. I saw a little smirk on your face. Yeah, well, I think you purposely put that tool into that <laughs> what? Saying, lineup. Saying your hoe would work? What do you think I could teach Starry to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, well, we probably would We would probably let our, our kitties outside and let them hunt. And hopefully they'd hunt enough and bring something back. Yeah. I tell Maggie to go get a squirrel. And she'd be like, oh, it's fluffy like me. Let's play. <laughs> and my cat would be like, no, I think the killer instinct your dinner. would come out. You think so? Oh, yeah. If she got hungry enough? Yes. She, yeah. would, she would eat your face if she got hungry enough. What? Not sweet, Maggie. Yeah, that's what oh. cats do. Yeah. Mm-mm. 
she'd eat your face first because she'd be like, oh, this is this is mine's love. bristly. Yeah, no. but she is she's really rough tongue and stuff. She could handle your it. Face. No, she eat your face. She'd be like, <laughs> she'd be like, I love the saltiness of, it. and it's like his sweat from his underwear, and I love rolling in that. <laughs> How's so. my sweat from my underwear on my face? Because <laughs> it's a part of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, your face is cute and supple, and looks like, looks like pate. So, she <laughs> she would be like. I'm going to get some Terra Pate. <laughs> well, yours is handsome and rugged, and she'd be like, I want a big, thick steak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, funny. Right. It's funny. First We're, tangent. It's funny Woo! other people hear this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that's how not fun the end of world discussion is. I don't know how like, anyone's listening to this, but we're available on iTunes <laughs> and Podbean and... I think we're on iHeart and Stitcher and. But you know, look, I grew up in the generation. We've talked about this. You the never music. Grew up. I'm growing backwards, hopefully. <laughs> the my generation's music was grunge. Terrible. And so, like, one of them was, "It's the end of the world yeah. as we know it." Yeah. It, okay. What is fun about that? You know, there were so many songs. Oh, there was another one that I'm a loser, baby. Why don't you kill me? Oh my me? gosh, why, why? <laughs> like, and I even remember as I was a young teenager when that was not even a teenager at that point, and I remember thinking, it's a catchy tune and it was popular, and I'm like, I can't sing this. Right. Yeah, like this is ridiculous. Right. And you grew up in a vibrant '80s. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was sunshine and sparkles and colors. Everything was was uh, they were dynamic. They they exercised. Obviously, the bands did. They were very dynamic on stage. Yeah, you know. I thought you meant we were talking about exercise bands. You know, like no. on your wrist <laughs> and on your forehead, and and there yeah. was always hot girls in the videos, and they weren't doing the stuff the girls do now. What do they do now? Uh, well, they were, what do they do now? I, I never had MTV or anything. So well, like, everything is about big butts. and and. There's a song about that, too. Yeah. That was, <laughs> a, few that was of them. a great song. Yeah. <laughs> Sir Mix a Lot. That's a great song. The, the, the one who, where that country singer does the version. Oh, uh, that, yeah. That's really yeah, funny, that, too. That is funny. That's a good one. So, the one I wrote down that uh, while you were talking, you know, Men, men will be a, will prep more. Women like to nest. Women like to have enough around to be secure. Men like to prep because men need adventure. So men think about this kind of stuff. You know, how do I defend my home? How do I defend my land? How do I provide the food? How do I, you know, and so a lot of guys, well, guys will go too far. I've gone too far a couple times in my life with prepping. You know, having having extreme amounts of weapons and preparedness gear and that kind of stuff, and and I'm a little more casual now. Have we actually had forever f- stores of food expire yet? We've never eaten any of them. I know, but they're no, they they're keep 25 for years, years, years usually. Okay, so we have a few more years to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. I think the seeds might last longer. Now that we're storing seeds or anything. No. So you think guys are... I think there are are there are hardcore prepper women in the sense... Coming from the perspective of protection, you know, and again, not... You know, it is in a, a woman's nature, and obviously we're generalizing, so if you're having a problem with this... <laughs> Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> but it is like... Yeah, not running out, not even getting to that situation. I, yeah. I do think that there are hardcore prepper men Although and women. we ran out of butter last week and you didn't seem to care. Oh, I... I you know, <laughs> here we are on to food. So I wanted to talk about food. I wanted to thank you, first of all. I have felt... I have felt busier than... I, not most recently, but like in the last year busier than ever and you mostly in my mind because I might not be doing something physically I think that's the difference between different kinds of work is even if you're busy in your mind 
that occupies you and you have taken care of food a lot of the times and um, fortunately you're a great cook and an excellent cook an amazing sauce maker so saucy <laughs> and it has been extremely helpful but what happens is I have not been keeping track of what's in the freezers what's in, what's on our shelves and you just tend to buy which is fine and you're like I'll just put it in the freezer there's not room I'll buy another freezer where are we gonna put that freezer I don't know let's put it in our bedroom <laughs> or near something a, near a plug-in yeah near a plug-in <laughs> and I'm like oh my god I gotta organize this and defrost it and I'm like I don't and anyways yes we ran out of butter I have not organized the freezers well, in a long time. Sounds like it was my fault because I've been taking care of the food, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it is what it is. But we have a lot of extra rice crackers, way extra sauerkraut. <laughs> like we have a case, and we've yeah. been buying sauerkraut. Yeah. So lots of frozen foods, lots of canned foods, extra water. Mm -hmm. We usually have. An extra, f I have 14 five gallon jugs of water. Yeah, we've got to get some, don't we? Yeah, we got to replenish that supply, but yeah, it's normally what we have is 14. So it's, it's, Which is not a a, it's not a fun topic. I think it's kind of like something that. Well, once if, you take care of the, take care of everything, you don't have to worry about well, it. Well, there are time frames. There are like, okay, do we have enough for two days, right? Mm -hmm. Do we have enough for two weeks? Then it's two months. I don't know if that's the official timeline, but I think of that for myself. You know, like, okay, we're good for a couple of days. Do we have, do our, like, when I was talking with my friends, she's like, well, do you have a Faraday cage to protect your generators and stuff like that? I'm like, well, we actually have a Faraday cage, but it's not completely closed off. I'm like, no. She's like, well, are you disassembling? And we were joking at this point. She's yeah. like, are you disassembling your electronics and everything so it will survive? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ask her if she her family has any guns? No, because I know the answer to that. What's the answer? No. They don't. I'm sure. Yeah. I would bet a lot of money. Yeah. No, I I bought her a billy club, uh, or a, a thumper. Um, they live in the cities, and especially when the riots were happening, that was when the riots were happening, yeah. and so I I bought her a hickory, so it looks nice, you know, so if it's sitting in the corner which it should be, right? Readily accessible. Yeah. Um, and she got a kick out of it. She appreciated it. So does she <laughs> say, hickory doc, I'm going to whack you in the clock. Yeah. <laughs> she probably would. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to have something to defend your home. No, it, two months. You said two months. So uh, two months, in my mind, we have more food than that. But two months, if it goes on for two months, you're going to be planning other things. Yeah, th we have food for that, but do we, like I was explaining to her, we have generators, but you have to have fuel that will last. And how long does fuel last these days? Well, generators won't work if there's a solar flare, if it hits us. Right. Now, there's a chance that some things will work. Not everything will get knocked out, depending on, like you said, where it is. Is it shielded by something? Is it sitting in a room that has some shielding? Mm -hmm. um, it would be a good idea if we thought we were going to get a solar flare to put our generators in that room that is shielded. Mm -hmm. um, because it's mostly protected. Well, it, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, the shielding dissipates the the EMP burst. Yeah. Um, we have, That's what I meant. We have is EMP, if it could be used as a weapon, EMPs. Yeah, we have EMP um, devices for our vehicles. Um, and Are they in them? No, not right now. Oh. But I got them. Okay, good. <laughs> it's like our bathtub. <laughs> We've got it. We, well, um, you got to have to install everything. You know? Yeah, there's that. <laughs> We've got a podcast to do, though. Like, we got to go bike riding. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, there's trade-offs, right? There there are trade-offs. Well, you're not taking a bath. That you can take a shower, but you're not taking a bath tonight. So nope. We're not, we're not putting the tub in today. So We could just seal off the hole and then just, like fill it and empty it and just put got, it among the plants a, here it's got a hole sealer already it's got a drain plug in it oh good yeah great we could just seal the hole yep <laughs> just trying to help with solutions good so we have emp protection for 
the vehicles, but also, didn't you get it for the building? Yes. Yeah. But like what my friend said too, she's, so they live in the cities, like I said, well, if you're the one neighbor that has a generator and is a gas power generator in particular, you're going to stand out, right? People are going to hear that and then you're a target. They may or may not hear it because you could easily build a, a container that would stifle the noise and they're very quiet. Oh, the new one that we got is way quieter than... We have two of them. Yeah. And we have a electric generator also. Oh. So if a solar powered electric. Yeah. That's what I was wondering, like, you mean the, the solar power? The Jackery, who is not a, an official sponsor of this podcast that should But be. we have recommended their products. Someone has asked yeah. us about which generator. It wasn't even the same lady. Mm-hmm. And we recommended the Jackery. Yeah. And, um, and that works really slick. I've had it plugged in. I've had the solar chargers on it, solar panels. I've had it plugged in. I've been using it. Didn't lose ha- hardly any power. It was charging a uh, device while it was solar charging, and it was almost a one-to-one exchange. It was. Wow. Yeah. Well, we recommended the Jackery in particular for her. She's also in a bit populated city, but she mainly wanted something to be able to run appliances if the if the power went out. Yeah. And the Jackery is something you can easily bring inside without, you know, a, a no gas emissions, powered. Yeah. yeah, gas powered. You have to keep outside for emissions, noise, and so you'd have to have a lot of extension cords. But the Jackery you can just bring inside, mm-hmm. and hook stuff right up. Yeah. So pretty handy there. Yeah. Prepping done. Yeah. So, yeah, there there are definitely other things that we could do for prepping. Uh, we've talked a number of times about gardening. Uh, a lot of that has to been, has part of that has been also like, are we going to put the work into this place? You know, how long are we going to be here? And canning is a great process for preserving food i mean a really good choice is frozen food it preserves the nutrients really well as long as you have electricity but as yes as long as you have the space electricity canning is terrific because you don't you just need the space for it you don't need to keep it frozen if you process it well if you process it right you'll keep the nutrients if you do like the old fashioned ways of processing Mm -hmm. and then um yeah, we've talked about a greenhouse so that we can at least grow certain vegetables through the winter or start things, start our own vegetables. Grow longer, start earlier. Yeah. And really, what it comes down to, we've talked about having a permaculture environment. So we're collecting our own rainwater, composting. But that's a whole, whole big thing. I mean, you're really going relatively to. relatively easy. Collecting rainwater is a little bit more, you know, you're going to have spouts on your roofs and you they got to have a big tank and mm-hmm. you know that kind of stuff mm-hmm. then you have to filter it and boil it and oh i just mean for the garden oh yeah that's not drinking water well if the power goes out our well won't work yeah there's to hook it up to a generator if the generators don't work you have no water very quickly which is why i have 14 five gallons actually i have more the water that we drink that we like, I have 14, and then I have another 12 of another water that I have down in the shop. I drink that too, but not not as often. Well, fortunately, also, we live just a mile from a, a lake. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if it came down to it... We have filtration devices, yeah. So I realize as, as we've traveled around the country, you know, we have a lot of water. We have a lot of lakes around here, so that's fortunate. It's not fortunate in the sense that there's a lot of runoff from fields, sprit, farm, farm, fields, farm right. fields. So there's that, <laughs> right? And uh, you poison yourself with glyphosate while oh you're getting hydrated. <laughs> I just realized I'm going to make a shirt or something that says, "Oh my gosh." <laughs> <laughs> I should just say it really Minnesotan just for the fun of it. I mean, it probably already sounds really Minnesotan to certain people, but <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, so I've looked at, you, you know, then you wonder, like, I've wondered, you know, we are well off in the sense that we're in a number of senses. First of all, I have you. Yay, you got me. I got you, babe. We're 
an hour away from the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's a good distance. It's a good distance. You can, you, you're not spending all day if you go in. You're definitely spending half a day. So you're far enough Sometimes away only from three hours. You pop oh, in you yeah. for an hour and you pop out. So far enough away to be like, especially this last year when the riots were happening and stuff. You know, we felt fine. You know, yeah. like they weren't walking out here. <laughs> nope. But in this part, lot a lot of Minnesota is is farm farm country, and it it's basically all. Uh, conventional farming, farming, and so you know we have fields around us. We have terrific trees on this lot too, but the fields are not far away at all. Mm. And it seems like they've been spraying extra this year. You know we've we've seen the tractors out multiple times. We, there's an airplane out crop the duster. other crop duster the other day, and so it's like okay, at what point do you just go? This is where I'm living. It's not ideal. I'm going to make the best of it. And even if it's for a couple years, or do you just go, we need to find the ideal location and do what we can there? At what, do what you point think? do you do that? Well, you do it when Here's you can. Airplane again. You do it. You do it when you're when you can. You do it when your situation allows, when the environment calls for it, when your finances are lined up. You know, there's there's lots of mechanisms that go into a move. So. Well, the great thing about storing food is. Then you have to find something that's better than what you have. So, situation for land, for capabilities on this land. I mean, we can have a huge garden. We can have we could have 150 chickens easily if we had a huge garden. You know, we could let the chickens out. We could fence in the garden. We could let the chickens out in the garden during the day. I did the, the day. chicken tractors you yeah, need for... take care of bugs and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, we've got... Uh, I forget what it is here. We have six acres, I think. So I've looked at even properties, let's say, like closer to Brainerd. Now, I personally actually don't want to move more up north. You want to move to the north, Tara? <laughs> actually... <laughs> Not in the sense of it actually does get a little colder, a fair amount colder up getting north. up north. Oh, yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot colder. Heck yeah. Well, it depends on how far north, but even Brainerd is, mm. it will even here is colder than the Twin Cities. It can be several degrees difference just even getting outside of, I think as my friend said, the asphalt island or Concrete something. Concrete jungle. Like but what you get up there is there are so many lakes around Brainerd in particular mm -hmm. is that, you know, they can't really farm it. And There's a lot of rock, too. That's probably starts it. starts to get more <laughs> in the Iron Range area and the granite and the all that kind of stuff. So it makes gardening tricky, but you can compost and make your own soil and bring in soil. But I, I, I have actually thought about, you know, even those kinds of areas because you're away from the crops, you know, and the, there, but you're by the water yeah. in the sense that you have that as a resource. Yeah, and you're away from the cities, you're away from, you know, you're, you're living in civilization basically, but you're away from civilization. You know, you have everything that modern amenities offer but you're away from the mass of people, which is always suited me, you know. Well, I think Brainerd is actually quite populated. It's just spread out, and it's a, a popular vacation place, so they have mm -hmm. nice amenities and... Good restaurants. Yeah, apparently it's really popular for golf, so there, you get away from the fields, but then you get the sprayed golf. There's a few casinos up that way, so you can... Yeah, you can get your gambling on. Go gamble. <laughs> Shoot craps. So I think, you know, you tend to be the more prepper planner, like we need to get this, this is the next step here, where I think along these lines anyways, it's like, gosh, you know, what why, What do you put into where you're at? And maybe most people are already, they're at where they're at, right? You got what you got. You put in whatever you want to put in. <laughs> so yeah I don't really like to think of those things but it's kind of the reality you know that 
like I told my friend, boy, if that happens, I just, if it's bad enough to like wipe us out technologically and we're starting from before zero, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd like it just to take us all out, you know? <laughs> well, I'll say for myself. I won't speak for other people. You don't have to take to you take out. Us all out. <laughs> There's, it's not possible to take out the entire human race. Yeah. There's always well, pockets. Well, yeah, we know the Amish would survive. survive. We've they, already decided that. They would survive just fine. Yeah. yeah. So Except they, for the people with the guns would come and take the horses. So they might not survive so well. Yeah, if they can get to them, though. What? To be far enough out. Oh, the Amish live near cities. Yeah, you can walk. You can ride bike. You ride bike with your AK-47. I can? You go steal a horse and buggy. <laughs> Oh, man. It happened really fast. I think the Amish would probably get wiped out pretty quick. It's the end of the world <laughs> as we know it. It's, okay. It's not. So what did you want to get out of this conversation? Why did you want to bring this up? Because um, I want to wrap it up. Let's have a cupcake. A cupcake. <laughs> I don't know. You were talking about food, and I didn't really want to talk about food so much. Okay. So you wanted to talk about end times no, potential. Share, you know, you're sharing the fact that you had... A random conversation with a friend and she brought it up yeah it was you know that's now they live her and her husband her and her family lives in Minneapolis and they yeah. experienced a lot of problems in 2020 yeah you know the there's and there's still a lot of problems and so it's like you know I mean thinking of a thinking of a bigger problem as a way to deal with right it's like you got a cold but hey at least I don't have cancer right but we had riots and the city was getting burnt and there's still things that aren't back to normal and well at least there's not a solar flare <laughs> yeah you know so it's it's like a it's like a exponential rise in threat level to make you feel comfortable about where the threat is right now oh. you know which is fine you know i i'd be trying to deal with what i what's on my doorstep you know if I was somebody that lived where they live, I would have moved as fast as possible. There were people who did that. Yeah. yeah. I'd put my house up for sale immediately. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd even discount it to get out of there. Well, that's another thing we did talk about is how the government is going to get its trillions back. And well, it's the, actually the, next round, the next round of riots or problems are not going to be so nice because the the people that have been rioting and did get arrested got let out and lots of criminals got let out of jails and so the next round is everybody knows now what's not going to happen to them they're not going to get arrested they're not going to be afraid and the people that live near those areas need to be very very afraid so yeah yeah. and i already i gave them their get out of get out of the city's past and I won't be able to do that the second time I said I would come and pick them up if they needed to get out oh I won't be able to do that the next time oh I see it'll be too riotous it'll be too crazy so yeah well I know it's so different as I remember um we were going to get together I was going to get together with her when around the time of the riots in the Minneapolis and she's like no things have died down and it you know it's you know that only happened it was like 18 blocks away or something or 10 blocks well, as away you walk down the street and you walk by a burnt out gas station that that was a BP that's not being rebuilt well what I'm getting at is and this is not at all a, a knock on her at all this is just I, I think a, a, a common perspective difference between people who live in a populated dense city as opposed to people who live in the country you know i'm like 10 blocks that's city blocks are different than country blocks i'm like that's not far away at all right you know realistically i mean someone can book it and on foot and you know within ten blocks they could be at your house in 10 minutes easily yeah if they have have endurance and speed <laughs> Well, or then, just even will. And then you got to ask yourself, you know, you got to look at your family and, and let's say you, you have a young kid and you and your husband don't exercise regularly. You got to ask yourself, can we run away? 
if we have to run away, can we run away? And if you can't run more than a couple blocks, you can't run away. John, can we talk about food? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, these are just the facts. I mean, it's, this is going to be probably yeah. the most boring podcast to everybody. I don't know. Someone. We'll just call it the boring podcast. <laughs> All we talk about, about is riots and death solar flares. And and yeah, the end of the world as yeah. we know it. No, I'm Super sure it'll be power person on that sun throwing. You know solar what I think will be relatable is I'm sure there are plenty of couples who don't go down this path because one or the other it's the same dynamic. One person is like, we have to prepare, and the other person is like, I don't even want to talk about it. Well, I didn't. Can ask we you. put our money into let's this? Lo- let's talk about that. Yeah. I didn't ask you. I didn't ask permission for anything. No. I just did it all. I bought generators, I bought freezers, I bought the food, I bought everything. I bought all the prep food. I bought, I, I did it all. I yeah. just, I never asked you. If I need a gun, I buy a gun. I know guys that are still arguing with their wives over having a gun in the house after the riots. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't have a gun in your house? <laughs> mm-hmm. I run out of places for my guns. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you don't have a gun in your house? Are you kidding me? How are you going to protect your family? Let's say four guys break into your house, and you're you're one dude. Let's say you are a phenomenal martial artist, and four dudes break into your house. You're in trouble. You, you don't have any weapons. You don't have a gun. You know, well, okay, you've got knives and you've got a sword. But what if they break in with guns? I mean, you got to have at least equal or greater force. And with four people, you got to have probably a two times multiplier in order to fight off four people. So you have to have a gun. I mean, if, if, if I'm coming after you and I weigh twice your weight, I'm probably four times your strength and maybe seven. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> depends on what we're doing. And you have a gun, I'm dead. I can't fight. All you have to do is that put a three pound pole on a trigger and you launch kinetic weapons at kinetic ballistic rounds at me that are going to go through my body. You know, I'm not going to flex them, stop them. <laughs> I thought you were Captain America. Well, I put I my head do down that. because it's just made of stone, so they just yeah. ricochet off my head. But Iron Man. Okay. Stonehead. Stonehead. <laughs> That's Easter yeah. Island. So. If you don't, I don't, I can't even, I, yeah, I mean, I've never had to use a gun on a person, I've never had to pull a gun on a person, I've never had to threaten anybody with a gun, but I'd rather be a gardener in, a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I'd rather have the skills, the knowledge, the ability, I'd rather be carrying a gun and never have to use it than have a a need for it and not have anything. It doesn't make any sense to me. So, you know, it's, I, I don't even know. I can't even fathom it. You know, I'm not going to name names because some people might listen to this, but geez, you know, get get off your, your really idiotic bum and get on with it. Make sure you can take care of your family. You know, I don't like thinking about the potential for violence you know like that kind of violence you know rioting someone breaking in you know that kind of thing but i also don't want to be naive ignorant uh you know and just like turn a blind eye and then and then oh crap you know and it what gets me around this sometimes or just gets me thinking about it differently is thinking about you know, the pioneers, the settlers, and the cowboy days, right? And it it apparently, at least by the movies, and they're 100% true. Yeah, and someone came to the door, at least in the movies, they show, you know, you greeted them with a shotgun, and <laughs> as you figured out who they were. Yeah. And I, I guess I assume there was a lot of that. I mean, there's plenty of stories. You know, we were just in in South Dakota and they had wild bill days and you know it obviously was apparently was a very different time 
And how did we become more civil, as they say, you know, where, you know, there are some states that have open carry, but not many. And that's just not, and they're not dueling in the streets. No, you know? no. When we were in Arizona uh, a few years back, we drove up to a gas station and everybody was open carrying. And you looked around and you said, oh my gosh, look at all the people with guns. And I'm like, hey, we're at the safest gas station we've ever been to. You know, I went in, the, went into the, to pay and, or to grab some water or whatever I went into the gas station for. And there was a guy in there, he squatted down. He had a low slung holster that, that mounted to the side of his leg with a strap on his leg so he could so he could bend over and, and put things on the shelf. He was stocking all the mini donuts and the Little Debbies and all these really great snacks that I eat all the time. And <laughs> and uh and the guy there was guys in there, you know, shooting the shit and just joking with each other and laughing and, and you didn't you wouldn't have known if you didn't look on their waist that everybody had guns. You wouldn't have known. It was just it was normal. You know, but I felt very safe in that gas station. I was like, nobody's robbing this gas station. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody's going to do a random drive by. You know, there's probably a guy in the parking lot with a rocket launcher in the back of his truck. You know, it's like, <laughs> drive by my ass. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I feel very comfortable around weapons. I feel very comfortable around people that know how to use weapons. And, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. You know, that's, that's uh yeah the meek are the ones that have weapons but know how to get through life without using them and that's and those, that's metaphoric too yeah. i mean someone you there are people who have weapons as tongues mm -hmm. and they'll slash you to bits or they could use that to to present a case they could use it to build you up they could use it to help you do something they could use their oratory skills to teach you they could yeah, or they can just think that they're better than you and, like you said, use their tongue, their forked tongue, like a serpent. You know, to kind of contradict all, all of what I said before, I actually really enjoy training and the <laughs> de deadly force kind of training. But it is so true. I don't think I've even watched Karate Kid, at least not all the way through. But it is so true. I, I think the quintessential takeaway from Karate Kid is, you know, there's metaphor or so many, you know, martial arts movies, right? There's metaphor in the training yeah. that you will experience later in life. But it's absolutely true. Yeah, because Mr. Know? Miyagi taught daniel son that when you move your hand this way, that is the wax on. And when uh -huh. you move your hand this way, that is the wax off. Yes. And when we first saw that in the theater, we started laughing and we said, Daniel son, wax up. <laughs> <laughs> ah, those funny movie people. <laughs> and there truly, there was a point where I remember asking you, like, I don't know, with what I've learned, I don't know if I would, I know enough to do this move and do it automatically, but I don't know if I know enough to stop myself before I really hurt someone, mm -hmm. potentially. Well, you'd only be in a situation where you had to, and you, if you had to, you would do what you needed to do. Mm -hmm. You, you, you know, I, th I believe your spirit is going to guide you, right? So I, I believe that your your once you train your body. And you have the skill, you have the innate skill in your in your muscles. You can go on automatic, right? Mm -hmm. So your body then can move in the ways that it needs to move, and you know your your physiology knows what's going on. And you know, because a lot of times when you get in situations like that, you're kind of separate. You're you're mm -hmm. not feeling like you're in your body. Yeah, I've had those situations. In nonviolent situations. There hasn't, violence has not occurred yet, but there was right on the verge. <laughs> so what I've come to these days is, is kind of your, I'd rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war phrase, is that it is not comfortable to talk about these things, the potential for death, destruction, violence, and, and so forth. And why is that? It's only talk. Well, I don't know. Let me finish sure. where I was actually trying to go. In But my concern is that 
having experienced the 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 weapon of the tongue let's just say you know where people are really violent i I think that's overlooked where people don't see that how violent they're they're verbally abusive verbally abusive and i don't just mean that they're saying can i touch your hair you know and it's it's perceived as racism because you know i don't mean these these soft very soft perceptions of violence. No, you're talking about people who are deliberately trying to do you harm. People who you care about that are that are verbally tearing your heart out and stomping on it. Yeah, Yeah. repeatedly. Yeah. And so that experience in life, having experienced violence in in that form, again, is like the the martial arts movie, is a metaphor for other areas of life. Mm -hmm. And what concerns me is that if people become so unfamiliar with what is actual violence, like doing doing potentially harmful training, training and and lethal arts, you get a respect for what is what is actually harmful, what can hurt, what it feels like to be hurt and in unintentionally mm-hmm. even but you also if you're not training those things you're losing the ability to see the potential for harm and you become a greater vic- uh, have the potential for greater victimization mm-hmm. i'm i don't feel like i'm speaking clearly enough well, is that clear enough it's a hard topic right because it's a hard topic people will resist you saying that words can be violent let me make one more illustration okay so for example when i lived in brazil for a year uh, i lived in belarusanch which is a really big city had over a million people i came from a town of a thousand people Mm -hmm. and i would have i thought initially like wow these people are crazy they're like so paranoid about don't go down that street or you can go down that street but not at that time <laughs> lock your doors at this intersection we you know we can't go into that turn lane because it's common that you'll get hijacked or whatever yeah. and you'll learn th- these street smarts that are common for these people and they're living it every day but what that taught me is you know you there is a healthy level of awareness you know you i grew up as you know living in the suburbs and oh everything's hunky dory does anyone say that these days <laughs> and it's hunky not hunky hunky dory what but what happened is during that time in brazil i became much more aware of what is violence what is evil what is the potential what is safe what is not and i think it really prepared me for other situations and made me less naive and i think that is incredibly valuable because for so many for so many reasons go ahead you talk for a while i think you're going to clarify what i'm trying to illustrate no well my my we've seen the people nowadays talk about microaggressions talk about words as violence and if you're going to be violent towards me i can be if you're going to be verbally violent towards me i can be physically violent towards you and that's that's where the line can't be crossed Right. No matter what anybody says to you, you can't get physically violent with them. And that's those lines have been blurred and they're blurred by people who have never fought. They're blurred by people who have never experienced physical violence. Right. Because when you've experienced physical violence and you've experienced verbal assault. Right they're way different Mm -hmm. they're way different when i was a kid it was sticks and stones might break my bones but words will never hurt me right we used to say that to other kids when they call us names right if they called you a name you would laugh at them and go sticks and stones can break my bones but words can never hurt me Mm -hmm. and then you'd get in a fight Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. because i'm rubber and you're (coughs) glue whatever bounce off me sticks yeah right, right yeah and we had those phraseologies 
and they did lead to violence. They led to fighting because the other kid that was trying to hurt you realized he couldn't hurt you. Mm -hmm. And so then he would get violent, physically violent. And you would fight. And then you learned how to fight. You learned who was tougher. And then you got your hierarchy built. You know, you got your pecking order. And even if you got beat up, usually that kid wouldn't beat you up again. Mm. You know, it wasn't like he came and beat you up every single day because you got smarter, you got wise, you got... I mean, if you're watching the UFC, two fighters get together and fight, right? Well, one fighter gets beat, and the next time they fight, the guy that got beat beat the other guy, right? And mm -hmm. that's the way it is when, when you're kids, when, when all these people are afraid of these bullies, right? At some point, you get fed up. I got, I got beat up quite a bit when I was a kid. So at some point, you get fed up, and then you learn how to fight. You remember everything. You know, the kid that beats you up usually doesn't remember what he did because I've beaten a few people up too, you know. <laughs> and But you remember when it's happening to you and you you see it in your mind and you strategize and you learn and, and then you, you might be like, I'm going to do some pull-ups and push-ups because when you're a kid you don't even know, right? Mm -hmm. And then your chest pops out a little bit, you know, and then your muscles get a little more defined and then you're a little bit scary, you know, when that other kid comes around six weeks later and looks at you, you don't look like the same person because you started doing stuff for yourself, right? Yeah. And that brings self-confidence. And, you know, the, this whole self-esteem thing was really a, a way to get people to stop becoming better because we're trying to build their self-esteem by just telling them that they're perfect, they're wonderful, they're all these things, right? When they're not, and they know they're not. You know, when you're a kid and you're, you just failed your math test and you're upset about it. And your parents, they're like, oh, well, we still love you. In that phrase, we still love you, is the fact that you failed. We still love you despite <laughs> the fact you're a failure, <laughs> right? So it's innate in the fact that your parents are talking to you, you know. And in uh, like the UFC, I'll use that again because everybody's seen it. It's a great analogy. They tell the guy who just got knocked out, you know, you can get him next time. Oh, thanks for telling me I just failed. You know, that's what a winner hears. A winner hears you are telling me over and over again that I just lost. You need to shut up and get away from me. Because a winner, a winner does not, a person that will overcome, they don't want to hear that. So these people that cannot overcome, they don't want to hear anything that offends them. They, they weren't given any skills. There's there's all this anti-bullying campaign, anti-negative speech campaign, anti, you know, you got to tell people that they're wonderful, but they're not one, more wonderful than the person sitting next to them because everybody's equal. And, you know, and all of a sudden they they can't cope with anything at mm -hmm. all. And so the verbal, the only people that can commit verbal violence, I will acquiesce to this against you, are people that you love. So you love somebody, right? And that person, if they know you love them, if it's a parent or it's a child or it's a spouse, or it, and that person then uses the fact that you love them against you, right? Then they, they, they go to pur purposely hurt you emotionally. They go to purposely, mentally, and emotionally beat you down. That is violence. That is physical and emotional. It's, it's verbal. It's physical because you feel it. You feel it in your heart. You feel it in your head. You feel it in your body. Your body gets depressed when somebody who you love tears that away from you and uses it against you. You get physically sick sometimes. Mm -hmm. You get just crazy crazy sad crazy crazy feelings you you know your world is being torn apart and that is the, those are the only people that can perform verbal violence against you is people you that you love not people that love you they might love you and you don't love them they can't hurt you mm -hmm. but if you love them they can hurt you mm -hmm. so that reminds me of one of the phrases that i think was most helpful for me when I had an occurrence like that where people that I loved were very verbally violent with me. Mm -hmm. And you made the illustration that 
we need to be able to communicate no matter how hard it is it's so important to quote use our words right you hear mom say that all the time use your words it is so important to be able to communicate and which is I'll add this caveat this this addition this side note that which is why it's so important that we we be able to use all kinds of words mm-hmm. you know without violent intention but if you are no longer able to express yourself then it turns into physical violence and what i remember is you know i'm not a person who who whose first thought is i'm going to physically be violent but when i had a very traumatic ongoing experience with people that i loved who were very verbally violent with me i couldn't communicate with them like i literally i could get into a counseling session a couple times but it was like it was like they were like i'm rubber your glue and i'm like no let's work through this let's work through and this whatever you say to care about me i'm going to hurt you <laughs> it was some and, yeah. and or you need to fix it i'm like i'm here i'm tr- i initiated the session i'm trying to fix this right and I f- experienced firsthand what it's like when y- you can't work through something with so- someone and you just want to like strangle them mm-hmm. or, you know or beat them up because you want you, you need your, to have some kind your of your words don't work your words don't work and when right? words when people can't communicate that's why people are talking about a civil war in America or a separation because when because they've got it polarized to two sides. And when two sides can't communicate anymore, that's when violence happens. Mm-hmm. Because you have to communicate somehow. And when you can't verbally communicate, you will physically communicate. Mm-hmm. Either by leaving or by staying and fighting. On a, on a similar note, I remember a similar... Because uh, I thought of kids right away when you said that, too. Because if they don't have the words to express, they might physically act out, right? Yeah, they'll kick and something, hit something, throw something, yeah. bang their head on the floor, you know. The, uh, but I remember when I first arrived in Brazil, and, you know, fortunately there, there are similarities where, like, my mom, host mom was going to run through a, a red light, and I didn't know how to say much. So I just went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just did something, you know, I made a noise yeah. that she might be able to, you know, come to attention. And so, it's a, but it's a similar, I think, internal reaction. Yeah. Like, I can't communicate, and I didn't, like, grab her. I mean, that would be another reaction, right, to grab her, but that would distract her too much. Yeah. And so I just made a, a general noise. Yeah. And a general noise that, you know, we, I think we have these innate sounds, expressions that communicate across cultures. Mm-hmm. Not all of them, but mm-hmm. uh, some of them. And so I, I think that's a non physical way of mm-hmm. saying just what you were saying. But I, I'll say it again how you say it the, if we no longer have our words, oh, what you well, say? you're going to communicate somehow. Yeah. Right? And if words don't work, you have two options. You can get physical. You can stay and fight. You can, for, you know, like people will grab each other and shake, like on the shoulders. They'll be like, you know, listen to wake me. up yeah. or listen or, yeah. you know, stop doing this, you know. Mm-hmm. And or you can leave. I mean, because when your words don't work anymore, they're the only, those are the only two options. Yeah. You leave the situation or physical violence may occur and so that's why when the cops show up they arrest somebody yeah or detain them they, just they get always them take in. one person yeah. out of the out of the home yeah you know it's it's better it, usually if they leave a person or if everybody says ah we're all okay you yeah. know, then there'll be another fight because people aren't equipped so this is what I experienced is I think this is the very slippery slope of modifying our language saying that this is a violent word that's a violent word because there's a difference between saying saying something that's just common vernacular and I can't think of an example there, no there are no or, violent words because you can say I love you or you can say I don't love you anymore and they two different feelings, right? I mean, I could see it on your face. No. I didn't. I wasn't even saying it to you, but there's you have a reaction immediately 
to that to that phrase. I'm going to give a better one. This is better. Go ahead. <laughs> you could say F you. Yeah. Or you could go F you. You know, like after someone says a a silly thing. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. That's a little. I think that's a little bit more. But if you take away certain expressions, we're using the same words, different connotations. Yes, that's that's what yeah. I mean. What I experience is that that's those same people who are being actually really violently with their words. Like, yeah, I know. You know. I was there. Um, is they would say that what I was saying was hurting them. Yes. And I'm like, that's that's the turning point of getting into violence, you know, like wanting to shake at the shoulders. And that's why I'm, I'm not a proponent of changing our language and so forth, or people just being able to say, you hurt me, yeah. you know. Yeah. I was I was bullied growing up, and I wouldn't change it. Mm-hmm. And it, it prepared very, it me. It was very valuable. It was very valuable. Yeah. And I learned the skills to, you know, decipher, well, is that true? You know, because in bullying, it, you know, both of us were teased for our physical appearance. Well, it was true. I was chubby, you know, yeah. and you have to face that. And it was really helpful when it came around to business, you know, where you, you get, especially when you're dealing with thousands of people, you get people who are saying, there's this, there's that, that that's not good enough. And you have to first of all go, is that true? Mm. And And then you decide, Okay, is that something I can do something you, about? You learn meta position, and I realized this when I took NLP. I was, I was, uh, mm-hmm. I was, um, I learned about. I think I learned about NLP. How did I learn about it? Oh, I found a book. Yeah, I went to the because I crashed on my motorcycle and I was afraid to ride, so I found NLP. But when I was teaching uh, RV, I was down in uh, Kansas somewhere, and I was teaching this couple and this guy, the Silver Fox, and that was his actual call name. Yeah. And uh, and he told me that I didn't have a good meta position, but it was like the class with Matthew the other night. My meta position was so integrated, I went through it very quickly. Oh. Because I learned my meta, I, you learn about meta position when you're being teased, right? Mm-hmm. Because you look at yourself intently. Yeah. So you separate from yourself and you, you try to view yourself, you know, why did I get teased there? Why did I get bullied there? Why was this happening? Why didn't that happen this way? And so my meta position was so fast that it wasn't, it wasn't viewable at first. I was I was in out in out in out in out. Mm-hmm. I could view myself from above, and it's called third position in NLP. But um, he says you you don't have a third position. The more we talked, he's like, oh wow. And I was like, yeah. Well, I was bullied a lot as a kid. I was teased a lot. So you're saying you would go in and out of it so quickly? It lo- it could it's be like easily my integration with my animal self. That Matthew, I said, mm-hmm. well, I don't even know. And Matthew's like, well, it's it's fully integrated. You know, and it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not even aware of it. It's it's, and like you speaking other languages, you're not aware of how good you are until you get around native speakers and they say, "How did you meet an American?" Yeah. Because they think you're from the dang country. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, that's that's your third position, your meta position. You're so good at adapting to the local colloquialisms and the vernacular and the and the the intonations and all the different things and they don't even realize that you're an american mm-hmm. you know and so that's that's a, a a good segue into how important it is to be able to receive that feedback you know any kind of valuable feedback, most of it, is not going to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, speaking of learning languages, you know, I had to be willing to hear from someone like, no, it's not that, it's this. Or having people laugh at you because you said something wrong. And it, and it might not just because they're mean people. Most of the time, that's not the case. It's because you actually said something funny. Yeah that you mixed something up and it was funny and but what you learn from it is so much more valuable if you can get over the feelings right. of oh my gosh are they laughing at me no they're 
yeah, they're laughing at what I said, you know. Well, we had, you had a, you, I, we, you had a Ford <laughs> Exchange student living with you when we met. And um, it would have been hilarious if we lived, all three of us lived together with her. She said, she, my, she said my parents found me in a bag of chips. Yeah. And the way she said it was, she said cheaps. No, I found her brother. Or I found her a, brother. It's a, and it's, it's apparently an expression, by the way, this does not rarely works yeah where you try to translate a, an expression into another language rarely works but apparently in italian you know like the the what i gathered is like the 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 runt you know, let's say uh, of the siblings or the disfavored one yeah. was found in a bag of chips yeah. or cheaps yeah so like in america you might say you know how'd your parents get you and i've heard if they got me in a cracker jack. They got me out of a cracker jack box. So yeah, yeah, that would be the equivalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it sounds like. So she said that, and that we teased her about that for so long. That was funny. Yeah. And she would laugh, and she if, after she understood that it was funny to us. Yeah. And her, she would miss speak so many things. Like she was like the modern day millennial trying to say the old time phrases and getting them wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, like out of the frying pan and into the fire. You know. You, well, you don't want to jump out of the pot and onto the stove. You know, it's <laughs> you know, it's like these these people nowadays that try to use the you know like a hog on ice or a flash in the pan or a you yeah. know all these phrases we have that are from time immemorial. You know, just well, we have the best one that we can't share on this podcast. But if we ever meet in person, you can remind us of the the best Italian expression. Oh yeah, yeah, that that was actually pretty. Good. It was really we funny. Can, we can. No, I think we should okay. not. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, words can they do they really hurt? And I think your point they about absolutely do, but not not the way the social justice crew is saying that they not microaggressions, not you know in non inclusive comments, not you know if you don't know somebody. You can't, if you're, if you're in normal discourse, normal conversation, normal, if you're in business or in it, you're not, you're not insulting somebody because you're not acknowledging every single thing about them and trying to protect everything that they might hold dear. You, you got to have interactions. You got to have a thick enough skin to be like, oh, that person doesn't think like me, but that's okay. You know, I'm here for something different. I'm not here for this person to think like me and to make them feel, make me feel comfortable. I'm here to pick up a car. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm here to get an education. I'm here to buy a wheelbarrow. <laughs> you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, I'm not at the hardware store so that I'm making sure that they don't have, you know, inclinations towards punching Norwegians in the face. You know, it's, <laughs> it doesn't matter. When you start, start. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't, first of all, it doesn't matter to me what people think. It doesn't matter to me what they say. It matters to me what my family, what my friends think and say, and, and the way that they treat me. And if they don't treat me well, they're not going to be my friends and family for long. You know, it's, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to be around it. So there's another variation I think that happens is when you're teased or bullied or mocked and rather than kind of going into the self-reflection you know let it be kind of phase is if you when you push back mm -hmm. and you're like oh yeah well you're this <laughs> and it's fine when you're a kid to do that for a while so you do have to learn how to push back appropriately mm -hmm. but when you're an adult and someone does something awkward so let's just say in, in my business, you know, I get lots of feedback about what's going on on sites and stuff like that. And I decide to take it graciously. Mm -hmm. And I make sure to thank people for taking the time to give their feedback and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it may not, I might not actually be feeling good about it, but it's important to, and it, it's, I'm mindful too as I am training people to handle help questions and stuff like that. It's easy to get in a mocking state. Like, could you believe that question or that that commentary? Yeah. And sometimes you really want to because just it's, call him a dummy. Just be like, yeah, well, you're a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> 
and we have on occasion just verbalized it but then I make sure that I'm in the right frame of mind responding that because I think that energy comes it is sensed yeah, just never type it in an email with their with their never. email address in the in the two because it's so I actually was typing out an email one time in the last several years and I was saying things that I wanted to say and then I was going to delete it. Yeah. But I had hit reply and so the person's email was in the to uh, space. Right. And I accidentally sent it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because your fingers click so fast now. Yeah. You know, it just automatically hit send and it was a keyboard shortcut and I just do it. Yeah. Yeah, so don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. It, it all ended up good. It ended up needing to be said and and uh, everything worked out, but that doesn't always happen. I think that relates back to patience, you know. And communication. And communication. Yeah. And should we say maybe the name of this podcast is We're, we're For Bullying or something? I mean, obviously, there are points where it goes too far. I mean, you had s- some instances where, like, you were really... I had viol- really there was violent bullying in my case. Yeah. There was uh, there was one time where I got invited over to play Hot Wheels in the dirt with the kids on this mound at the neighbor's house. It was two houses over, and we lived in a cul-de-sac, and the mound was in their front yard, and there was a tree growing out of the center of the mound. And we were all playing Hot Wheels on there, and then three the three kids I went over to play with, I brought a, a gallon ice cream pail full of Hot Wheels. Mm. Wow. So back then, that's what you had. You didn't have video games. You didn't have. You had Hot Wheels, and you mm-hmm. had Legos and Lincoln Logs and, and pickup sticks and uh, rec- erector sets, and and we had really dynamic things to play with. And so you would build all these roads, you know, and you'd build garages, and you for all your cars, right? Mm-hmm. You build jumps, and you might have a Dukes of Hazard car and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. You'd be like, yeehaw. Right. And Come on, Daisy. The three kids <laughs> jumped on me and started beating me up. Mm. And my, my parents were watching out the window. They knew. They, they thought, this is great. They're inviting John over. And I was called Johnny back then. And my dad ran over there, and he's tossing kids off of me. And he picked me up and took me home. And then he went back and collected all my cars and... and uh, yeah, so it was it was a very violent. I was shot with wrist rockets and and which is a slingshot and BB guns and chased so and that's a whole different level of bullying. But I survived. Yeah, I didn't understand why, and I learned later. Uh, every there were only two families in that neighborhood. There was about sixty five homes in the neighborhood, and there was only two families that. Their, the parents did not get divorced. And every kid in that neighborhood had a divorced family. And that was in it was that was the seventies. That was the mid seventies when the divorce craze really started happening heavily. And my parents didn't get divorced. I had the greatest home to grow up in ever. And my parents are still together and they're still the greatest people you'll ever meet. And I can't imagine what it was like for those kids Mm -hmm. because there was no precedent. I mean, now people think divorce. Yeah, I mean, people have four Christmases. They have four birthdays. They have all, you know, they go to all these different places and they have blended families. And I mean, people even living together, you know, with their ex-spouse that are married to someone else. And I mean, it's, it's, it's such a commonplace mishmash of crazy stuff nowadays that kids are, you know, it's it's uncommon that kids have parents that are married, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it's 50-50 now at least, and it's probably more on the divorce side now. Or, or not married. You know, how many kids have parents that aren't married, you know, that are their actual parents but are together and not married? What if you had... You know, got hit in the eye and lost an eye through it. Do you think you'd feel the same? I didn't. I was, I was, you know, I'd be making the best out of it. You know, I'd, I'd be like, Ah, Tara, I want <laughs> to take you to my chambers, <laughs> Pirate John. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd be, 
I'd make the best of it no matter what. It wasn't fun to go through at the time, um, but I stood up. You know, I stood up when it was one on one. I stood up when it was four on one. I ran. You know, and I was really fast. I learned how to run. You know, I, and I learned how to be resilient on my own. I learned how to do things with myself. You know, I was I always carried a knife. A, a buck knife, you know, and I would go out in the woods and I'd whittle and I'd make spears and I'd, you know, I tried to make a flute one time. You know, I was I was always doing stuff. I had a dog. I had two dogs. One dog that I would take with me. The other dog was just crazy. Would run all over the place. And but I, that was Nikki. You know about her. I'd take her with me and she just was by my side all the time. And and you know, man realistically you don't need 25 friends you don't need a bunch of kids that like you you know you need to a person needs to know who they are they need to be self-reliant they need to a young boy needs to explore you know i i was it was non-stop all the time you know i, I did have one friend but his dad beat him pretty bad all the time and so there were days when he couldn't come over, I'm sure, because he was all bruised up and, mm. and, uh, and you know. Is there a point that you think bullying actually does go too far? Like, you know. I wish that our society was focused around teaching people. So the parents nowadays that I see trying to teach their kids, they're, most of them are trying to teach their kids like they're adults. They're not, they're not relating to the child at the age they are. And you always want to be, you know, talking to them at their level and slightly above. You know, maybe their level and slightly below every now and then, but you want to help them be elevating themselves. But you can't talk to them at their level and 25 steps above. Mm hmm you know that you can't do that anywhere you can't do that you know if I just if I brought you into a martial arts gym and I started training you and all I did was punch you in the face and said well you gotta defend that you know and they punch you in the face well you didn't defend at that time either you know pretty soon you're gonna leave and you're gonna have a major fear of getting punched in the face mm -hmm. you know and and it's like well geez come on if I can do it she could do it you know it, you can't do that and that's what people are doing with their kids nowadays they want them to be so far ahead and so advanced that it's actually retarding them. You know, they're they're not developing properly. And my parents, you know, when I would come home crying and, and I'd say this happened, that happened, um, they would say, you know, you probably need to stay away from those kids. You know, and they're not nice kids. They would they didn't they didn't tell me how awesome I was and give me a participation trophy for getting my ass kicked. You know, they they told me that what the other people are like mm -hmm. you know that if they're going to treat you that way you can't be around them and they called the police several times but uh, back then it was just kids the cops would show up and go hey can you know can you keep your kids from beating up this other kid and and the parents would just be like rah, 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 you know mm -hmm. swearing and screaming and the cops would come back and go i don't think there's anything we can do about this you mm -hmm. know you guys might want to move mm -hmm. <laughs> you know my then my parents were told that several times by cops, mm -hmm. you know, and, and counselors. Like, <laughs> yeah, so the cops and the counselors are like, you know, yeah. you probably shouldn't hang around these people. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and, and they, and they, uh, they went to counseling one time. They went to mediation with with a with a particular family, the parents, and um, they screamed and hollered at my parents. Everything that they were doing, they accused my parents of doing, mm -hmm. and that was like probably the first case of borderline in America <laughs> and and uh, my parents couldn't believe it they were like oh my gosh these people are crazy and the and the mediator said you guys should move mm -hmm. you know this isn't going away yeah these people aren't reasonable we can't communicate with words yes It'll, yes yeah and those parents were encouraging their kids to fight so there's obviously no communication in the home that was proper and that was just all physical. But your parents didn't move right away. No, we lived there for, I don't know, four or five years. So it wasn't like 
oh my gosh, we've got to move and like the next month the for sale sign is up. No. And because whatever the reason might be, I mean, for a lot of people that may not be an option. Yeah, it was about know? a good, that neighbor, it was about a good two years that I was really getting. Or you have to move far enough or go to a different school, you know, but then you come home and they're the same kids they around. They did. My parents sent me to a private school and then when I came home, I was in the neighborhood still. And then mm -hmm. within a couple of years, my dad took a job out where we are now. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he drove for a year, so that was another year. Mm -hmm. yeah. I begged my parents constantly to move. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, they have built a house, and, you know, you can't just, mm -hmm. you can't just change your finances overnight. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't trade any of it. Um, yeah, like you said, I never lost an eye. You know, I didn't. I gained so much. I gained my. I gained confidence. I gained pride in myself. I gained, you know, self worth. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to build all that myself. You know, so. Not that I've been in fights, but uh, I think challenging situations having dealing with whether it's bullying or in business you're you're just challenged mm -hmm. but I but tied in with doing some kind of I really do think the martial arts really really help with this and that is knowing at what level to escalate mm -hmm. and when you're you're better the better you get at dealing with difficult situations mm -hmm the better you are at not escalating when it's not necessary. That's one of the axioms. We train how to fight so that we don't have to fight. Yeah. Yeah. Because you train to the level where you're wore out, you're tired, you're even afraid of your training partner at, at some level, right? You know? And or you create a, a training like, like knife sparring where you use a wooden dowel and you're afraid. You're afraid of getting hit. Yeah. You know, you're you're creating a a fear response and a, a calculated movement response in the other person and then you train all the attributes and if you have a good trainer they watch where you're good where you need work and they they allow you to grow in areas and then they push you hard in other areas and and having a really good trainer or training partner is is the it is other than training by yourself with equipment and gear it is about the only thing that there is in martial arts if you have a good training partner or a good instructor mm -hmm. yeah. I was it's so interesting that we were the other day in our podcast we were talking about the 10,000 hours or that was in class with Matthew and then like the next Huberman podcast that I listened to was about how to greatly increase your your training ability retention capabilities and he's talking about studies of how to get the most out of training and he was talking about open loop and closed loop training which i'm still trying to gather because they seem rather similar but one is basically if i were to equate it to martial arts is training on your own and you i think that's closed, closed loop. loop because yeah. you're working with yourself yeah. and open loop is like training with another person and you're getting that feedback of what to change so the ten thousand hours he's kind of commenting how that's true but not is what I'm gathering, not necessarily what he said, mm -hmm. but y you need that that open loop time, no matter if you're getting it correctly or not. You just need the repetitions to get in your system, mm -hmm. and then as time goes on, or you have some um, open loop training with someone else, they can correct like just one thing. At, I know this is so necessary for me because I'll be like trying to get something and you'll be like we'll do this and then this i'm like i just need what is that one thing yeah. and, <laughs> then over and, over and then we do it over and over and then we do it over and over and over and over again and so it's so why did i bring that up a, about ten training hours. ten thousand hours uh we've we trained fighting so you don't have to yeah, yeah so it becomes innate in your system like Maybe someone, a training partner, accidentally throws a harder kick or gets you somewhere, and it makes you mad or instantly. Or punches you in the face during knife sparring like you do to me. <laughs> oh, well, you you asked for it. 
and you you learn Chris because for a moment you want to like get them back right and then you assess okay that was an accident or that was a part of training you know or something like that and so it's uh, so this is why I am not completely about nonviolence. This is where my yoga training and stuff, you know, like there's a specific um, teaching of yoga about nonviolence. Well, who created yoga? The warriors created yoga because when they came back from war, they needed to do something to stay in shape. It wasn't peace-loving, stretchy people that created yoga. I think that that book is like the Dead Sea Scrolls, like... No one knows about that one. I mean, I haven't read that version either. I don't doubt it. Well, who I mean, created Qigong? Warriors. The, who created Wing Chun? Warriors. Well, Everything was created by warriors. Most of our technology yeah. comes from military technology. So it's pushing the it's, envelope. And, and It's such a strange dichotomy. Who were the philosophers? Warriors were the first philosophers. And it is, it gets back to bullying too. When you're pushed, you know, it, especially when you're bullied when you're young, it, it pushes you in these scenarios so that you're prepared when you're older. But you hopefully have parents or someone around that can help guide you through it. Like, well, maybe you shouldn't be playing with Timmy. In, or Yeah. Well, my dad would tell me to punch him, and my mom would say, don't. And, yeah, I was conflicted some for a while, and I didn't know how to punch early on. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was 10 years old, didn't know how to punch. Mm-hmm. So, not in a dynamic fighting situation. You know. So it makes you it makes you smarter. It you know the street smarts are not to be overlooked. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah, I was watching a thing the other day, and they were talking about all the people that are um, successful that have quit college and quit high school and that kind of stuff, and they when they really look at it, the numbers are overwhelming Hmm. about business owners and people who are successful and people who are innovative and creative. So they are literally the, the scrappers, Hmm. you know, you're willing to get in it and figure it out. Yeah. So before we go off on another topic, that'll be it for today. I think so. That's that's a really good, um, good chat. All right. I didn't have any sponsors this time. Oh, well. Oh. Hmm. What do you got? Until next time. Jackery. We had Jackery. And They're not a sponsor. Yet. No? Not yet. Oh, how about Cummins? Can Cummins be a sponsor? Yeah, generators. Yeah. Of course they could. Right. Absolutely. Well, we'll throw that out there. Yeah, we'll throw away our Jackery if Cummins wants to sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. How about that? Yeah, it's it's a... It's, a, it's on. It's on. It's an auction. All right. <laughs> Later.